Hey, this morning we're going to be talking about good news. Good news, right? We come here each week to celebrate the good news. What is the good news? Are we celebrating the good news? Or is the good news just something that we've taken for granted? We need to talk about the good news because it's changed my life. And I'm hoping that the good news of Jesus has changed your life. And we should come into this place weekly ready to celebrate what Jesus is doing in our life and what he has done in our lives. So this morning, I brought some balloons, all right? You probably think I'm crazy. I know the ladies at the dollar store think I'm crazy, all right? When you go into the dollar store and you ask for um, 75 balloons, people think you are crazy. She said, what balloons do you want? I want and I, I told her, I said, I want one of everything. She was like, it's October or November. You, you want a Valentine's Day balloon? Absolutely. Give me a Valentine's Day balloon, right? It's a boy. It's a girl. We love to celebrate things in this country especially, right? We love to get our family and our friends together and celebrate good news, right? Do you remember your wedding day, right? You get um, all of your closest friends and family, and, and I had 300 people at my wedding, and I got to show off my bride to the world, it was an amazing day. It was an amazing celebration with all of my closest friends and family. I wanted people to know the good news, the things that are happening in my life, right? So what are some things that we celebrate? What are things that we love to celebrate and to share the good news with people? In America, we spend a lot of money on celebrating, all right? I don't know if you know this, but we spend a whole lot of money to party. We like parties. We love balloons, and we love to celebrate. One of my favorite shows is Family Feud. So real quick, we're going to play some Family Feud, all right? The top 10 things that we love to celebrate here in the United States, and we're not going to do one at a time because I don't have that much time. But here's the first five, right? So number 10, things that we love to celebrate. We love to celebrate graduations, right? We even celebrate kindergarten graduate or going into kindergarten, right? Who knows why, but we spend $5.5 billion on graduation, high school graduation, college graduation. Uh, maybe you have a master's or doctorate. We spend $5.5 billion on graduation. All right, July 4th, we love to celebrate the good news that we have freedom in this country, right? That we have freedom of speech and we have freedom of religion. We love to get our family together and barbecue and celebrate the freedoms that we have. All right, what else do we like to celebrate? Um, we like to celebrate the Super Bowl, all right? We get all of our friends and our family members, even our worst enemies, we get them in the room to root for our teams because we're all family on that night, either rooting for a team or against a team, right? We spend billions on this, $14.8 billion to celebrate um, watching the Super Bowl together. Father's Day. We love to celebrate our fathers and what they mean to us. $15 billion that we spend on Father's Day. All right, Chuck, let's look at the top five here. All right. Um, I'll also just point this out to you. I'll just kind of point the elephant of the room out to you is that Mother's Day is a lot higher than Father's Day. All right. All right. But here we go. Um, number five, right? Easter. We celebrate Easter um, we spend billions, $20 billion on Valentine's Day. We love to celebrate um, the people that we're in relationship with and we're closest to. Mother's Day, $25 billion. Weddings, all right? We love weddings here in the United States. In 2018, the average wedding was $34,000, all all right, I looked at the knot yesterday. If you don't know what the knot is, I don't know why I know what the knot is, but I was on the knot website yesterday. Last year, it jumped to $42,000 that we spend on weddings to celebrate good news. All right, and then the top one. The top one just blows me away. We spent over $700 billion on the holiday season buying gifts traveling and being together as families and friends celebrating the holidays together. Isn't that, we spend a lot of money sharing good news. But the question is, is why aren't we sharing the best news? We share a lot of good news. We spend a lot of our money and our resources and our time sharing good news. But why are we not sharing the best news? Jesus has radically changed our lives and he's continually to work out his salvation in our lives. Why are we not sharing the best news? We're going to talk about that this morning. 
If you have your Bible with you, we're going to look at two passages this morning, one in Acts chapter 9, and then we're going to flip over to Romans chapter 10. Um, There's Bibles in your seats. Acts and Romans are back-to-back books. You have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you have the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9, we're just going to talk through it as a group this morning, and then we'll read some out of Romans chapter 10. What about the good news? What about the good news? Acts chapter 9, we're introduced to this character named Saul. Do we know who Saul is? Okay, we've heard about Saul. We've also heard about um, his other name, Paul, right? But in Acts chapter 9, we're introduced to this character and his name Saul. And what is Saul doing in Acts chapter 9? He's doing what? He's persecuting. I don't even know what that means. What is he doing? He's killing people. He wants to kill followers of the way. Now, who's followers of the way? These are disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus. Jesus has passed away. He's been resurrected. He's gone back into heaven. And now this guy named Saul is rounding up Jesus' followers, and he wants to persecute them, beat on them, throw them in jail. And he's so hungry, he even wants to kill them. All right? So we see here in Acts chapter 9, we see Saul going to the high priest looking for letters or some documents. He wants to go into Damascus to arrest followers of Jesus, right? And so he's on this road to Damascus, and what happens? What happens? He has this encounter with Jesus. It says the the light came on him, and he kind of falls to his feet, and it says he hears the voice of Jesus himself, and Jesus says to him, what? Why are you persecuting my people? No, he doesn't say that. Look at your scripture, Kathy. He says, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Jesus doesn't talk about his followers. Jesus puts it on himself. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul doesn't have an answer to this. He doesn't even know who this is, right? And then um, he gets blind and he gets taken into the town and the prophet comes to him and, and says, hey, you've had this encounter with Jesus. And it radically changes Saul's life so much that he had to go down to the courthouse and change his name. All right? Because we meet him here at Saul in Acts 9, and now we know him as Paul. The interesting thing to me about Saul, who's now Paul, is after he has this encounter with Jesus, if you look down in Acts chapter 9, verse 20, what is Saul now Paul doing? What is he doing in verse 20? He's preaching. Does Paul know how to preach? No, he doesn't know how to preach. Yeah, he knows how to talk, and he had some education, but the only thing that we know that Saul knows how to do is he knows how to share what happened to him on the road to Damascus. It was this immediate response. Something happened in his life, and he had to share the good news with other people, right? Like, this is so weird, because if you think about it, on Monday, Saul is hunting down and wants to kill followers of Jesus, and now on Tuesday, later in the week, maybe even the next month, now he is making followers of Jesus. He is leading people to Jesus. You see the radical transformation that's happened in Saul's life? He shares the good news. That's all he knows what to do. He knows he's had an encounter with God himself, and it's changed him so much that he wants to share that good news with other people, right? I mean, isn't that the natural response to experiencing good news? If you follow me on Facebook or my wife on Facebook, you know that the Hawses have tire problems all the time. All the time, mostly my wife, has tire problems. We have flat tires. It seems like once a week we have a tire flat. And so recently we had a flat tire. We weren't surprised. And so we take it up to the, to the neighborhood tire man here on Navarre. Um, we drop it off. They know us by our first and last names and it's probably social security numbers. And so we drop off the car to these folks and we said, hey, we have a tire problem and, and you just leave it there, right? And so you get a call. We got a call a couple hours later. They said, hey, Jacob, uh, we've kind of done the diagnosis on the tire and it's not replaceable. You're going to have to replace your tire. But uh, also just wanted to let you know, you have an all wheel drive car. And so typically what we like to do on an all-wheel drive car is we like to replace all the tires at one time. Perfect, right? Because everybody has five, six hundred dollars laying around for tires. And I said, sir, I I, I don't have that money right now. I said, can I just do the one or can I do two and then maybe come back after Christmas? 
um, and maybe get two more. He said, no, no. He goes, we really, we really need to replace them all right now. And I said, well, he goes, but here's what I want to do. I want to really help you out. He goes, I feel like it's kind of our issue, and I want to take really good care of you. And so can you, what if, what if for four tires, what if I charge you $75? And I was like, what? He goes, yeah. He goes, I, I'm going to replace all four of your tires for $75. I said, sir, that seems like a really good deal. Let's do that, <laughs> right? And so he replaces my tires for $75. Now, you know how many people I've told about the tire man on Navarre Road? Hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. Go to tire man. You will get four tires for $75. Like, that is great news. That is good news. I tell everybody, random people, about the good news about tire man on Navarre. But why am I not sharing the good news about Jesus? Like, why? Why? This is tires. I'm going to need new tires again in 30, 40, maybe 30 miles. I don't know in my, you know, my life, but I'm eventually going to need new tires. But the good news of Jesus has changed me for eternity. So why aren't we sharing that? I mean, that's, that's eternity forever. But for some reason, we've held on to the good news, and we need to talk about it this morning. Let's look at Romans chapter 10 together. I want to read a little bit of this, and then we'll kind of stop and talk about it. Romans chapter 10, the reason I started with Saul, who's now Paul, he, he gives his life to the gospel. He now travels from town to town. He starts churches. He, he talks about Jesus, and he gets followers of Jesus together, and they start churches. Now, the church isn't a perfect place, and so he has to write letters back to the church to remind them of the good news, to remind them why we follow Jesus, okay? And so in Romans here, Paul is writing a letter back to the church to remind them about the good news, okay? And so this is what we're going to look um, together at. Romans chapter 10, let's look at the fir first four verses together. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. I want everybody to experience God. I know what enthusiasm that they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. Let's stop just for a second and just figure out what Paul is, is reminding the church about here. He wants everybody to experience the good news of Jesus. Everybody. That, that's what gets him out of bed in the morning. He, he wants everybody to experience this. And, and as he's writing this letter to the church, he goes, I know there's a lot of enthusiasm. I know there's a lot of passion in the church right now. And it's, that's a really, really good thing. But here's the deal. It's misdirected. It's misguided. Why is it misdirected? Why is it misguided? Because they missed the whole Jesus part. They thought if they could just follow a set of rules that they could be made right with God and they would spend eternity with him. And Paul has to remind the church, no, no, no it's not about this law anymore. Jesus has, 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 has finished the law. He's completed the law, right? It is fulfilled through him. And so he's, he's saying it's been fulfilled through Jesus and all you have to do is believe, have an active faith in believing in Jesus Christ, right? This is the good news of Jesus. But we still do this, and, and I think Paul, it's a good reminder for us as the church today, it's not about a set of rules. It's not a set of regulations. It's not about um, if, I make, uh, if I barter with God. If, if I do this, then he could do this. And if, and, if, and if I go to church, then he can forgive this sin. And, and if I throw $20 in the plate, then God can do this. It's, this is not a bartering system. This isn't if you follow these sets of rules, then you get a golden key and you get into your condo in heaven. This isn't what it's about. Paul is reminding us it's all about Jesus. It's all about this relationship with God's Son who was sent for you and me so you can be saved, you can be set free from the biggest mistakes of your life, and he's going to journey with you until you meet him in eternity. That's good news. And he had to remind the church it's not about the law. It's about this thing called a relationship, right? That's good news for us. But let's keep going. Let's look at verse 9. Let's keep going. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord 
and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you believe, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is good news for us. But what about them? See, Paul changes his language here. It's, it's no longer about the Israelites. It's no longer about the Jewish people. It's not just about God's chosen people from the Old Testament. The law has been fulfilled. Now it's about all people. It's about these Gentiles. Paul says it here. He says it's for the Jews and the Gentiles. Well, hold on a second. Like, I was okay when it was just about us because we're all good people, right? We're here on church. We're at church, right? We're not on a ball field or we're not at Cedar Point or we're not doing whatever we want to do or having brunch somewhere. No, no, we're showing up to church. This is for us. This is good news for us. No, Paul's saying, hey, remember, this is good news for you and it's good news for them. So who are some of the Gentiles in our context today? The Jewish people are God's people, the Gentiles are everybody else, right? So if the good news of Jesus is good for white people, it's good for black people and Hispanic people, and Asian people, all people, all races, all colors. We have to start living that out, church. If it's good news for middle class people, it's good news for rich people, and it's good news for poor people. We need to start living that out, church. It's good news for people who watch Fox News. And it's good news for people who watch CNN. It's good news for liberals. It's good news for conservatives. It's good news for all people. It's good news for Cleveland Browns fans who need a lot of grace. It's good news for Baltimore. No, we're not going to go there, Chris, all right? It's good news for all people. All people. The people that we understand and the people that we don't understand. We live in a hopeless world and people are looking for hope and for some reason we're withholding the good news of Jesus from certain groups of people and it's not okay. And Paul reminds us of this. It's good for Jews and it's good for Gentiles, for all people. That's why my Jesus came, right? Jews and Gentiles are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 14, let's keep going. I changed a little bit of this. I think I changed pronouns. I don't really know my, my literature or language, whatever, but I wanted you to hear this a little bit more clearly. I changed the hymns to Jesus because that's who it's talking about, but hear this. But how can they call on Jesus to save them? unless they believe in Jesus. And how can they believe in Jesus if they've never heard about Jesus? And how can they hear about Jesus unless someone tells them about Jesus? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is why the Scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring the good news. Church, this is us. We have been blessed to experience the good news of Jesus. I hope that you are here today to celebrate what Jesus has done in your life. If you have never experienced Jesus, today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day that he could take the garbage of your life, the biggest mistakes of your life, he can take that away from you. If you confess your sins, he is faithful to take the sin from you. He will forgive you. He will give you grace, but then he won't live, leave you. He will give you the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to live your life, and, and the Holy Spirit will continue to transform you and turning you every day more and more into Jesus himself. Today is the day, but if you've experienced that, we've got to start sharing it. See, again, I think I've said it from this stage before, but we live in a day and an age where people don't even know the name of Jesus. We have kids all the time that come into the family house shelter, um, at the Cherry Street shelter, 
where we do some things at the Belief Center where if you share Jesus, they literally have no idea what you're talking about. They don't know that there was a God that created them, special, perfect. They don't know anything about sin. They know that they've made mistakes. They know that they don't feel right. They know that they have shame and guilt in their life. They don't know it's called sin. It's not what God designed for them. They don't know that Jesus came to forgive them just for who they are. He loved them so very much that he left heaven for them to set them free and to forgive them. They know nothing about that the Holy Spirit wants to live inside of them and to transform their lives. They don't know the good news, but we do. (laughs) And so how are you sharing the good news with people in your life? Are you sharing the good news? What does it look like? How, How are you doing it? I want to show you a graphic. This just kind of, um, kind of brings everything into reality for me. I, I look at this quite often, but this is a map of our area. Okay, this is the Toledo area, and I threw a little bit of Oregon in there today, but we have 20,000 people in Oregon in our area, right? A little under 20, about 19,000. Okay, we have 15 churches in Oregon. I don't know about you, but I don't think there's 1,333 people here this morning. There's not, 1,333 people are not in here this morning celebrating what Jesus has done in their life. There might be a couple hundred. As I look at the churches around town, and I don't know all the churches, but I don't know if there's one church in Oregon that's running 1,300 people. Which means we got work to do, church. Which means we have people in our own community that are hurting and broken and they need the good news of Jesus. And it's our call as messengers, as ambassadors of the kingdom to go and share the good news of Jesus with our friends and our neighbors and our families. That's on us. If you've experienced the good news, why are you not sharing the good news? In Toledo, we have 300,000 people in Toledo. We have roughly around 300 churches. Makes the math a little bit easier for me. But that's about 1,000 people in a church for Toledo. I can count on my hand how many churches in Toledo run 1,000 or more. We have work to do. We have work to do. Yes, we can continue to do programs and fun things and exciting things in the church, and, and, and we can do all of this cool stuff at the church, but this is what we're called to do. Jesus, as he's leaving his disciples, his best, these 12 men, he says, I want you to go into the world and make disciples. And when disciples get together, they start making churches. And when you start making churches that are involved and engaged in communities, you see transformation. It's called the kingdom breaking through here on earth today. Church, this is the reality of where we're at I love being together. I love being with you. I love the inn of the church, and I love the Thanksgiving dinner and all the things that we do around the holidays, but it's also a really good time to share the good news of Jesus with some hurting people. I have some people in my life that are severely broken. I have people coming up to me all the time, even on soccer fields, telling me the brokenness that's in their life. Can we stop cooking casseroles? Can we stop giving people clothes? and educating people, and all of these things, those are all really good things, but can we start giving them the answer? Can we start giving them the good news and sharing what Jesus can do in their life? That's the only place where they're going to find the hope and the peace that they're looking for. But we'd rather do a casserole, or we'd rather give clothes, or we'd rather give toys, or donate here so we don't have to say the name of Jesus. Well, guess what, church? we got to start saying Jesus. How does this good news get from Paul to us because people were sharing it. People before you were sharing the good news. I had this incredible opportunity to grow up in the church where people were passing their faith and the good news of Jesus with me. We are living in times where people don't have that. And so they need to hear the good news from us, right? My dad worked for UPS for 19 years, Um, loved his job. One day um, in one of our church services, I remember my dad and mom going down to an altar. And my dad said yes to sharing the good news of Jesus full time. My dad was a crazy guy. He, He called his boss after 19 years and a good job and a good pension and all of that and said, I'm done. His boss dropped the phone and said, what? He said, I'm done. 
My dad went into ministry, went back, took some classes, and before we know it, we are now a pastor's family. We're living in this small community outside of Mansfield, Ohio, and we are now full-time sharing the good news of Jesus, right? Professionalism, whatever that is, right? And I grow up in this environment, and we, we, when you move into a small town, the first thing that you have to have is a good barber, right? And so we needed to find a barber. Uh, my dad, I have an older brother myself, and so my dad goes through the yellow pages, and we find a barber. His name's Harv, Harv's Barber Shop. And so we go down to Harv's Barber Shop in this little town. And um, I've never been in an environment like Harv's Barber Shop. The guy opens the door, and it's like there's just clouds coming out of the door. It's a crazy environment. Um, the, the things that were talked about in this barber shop are words and things that I've never experienced before at this point as a 9, 10-year-old boy. Um, I remember looking at Harv for the first time. Harv had, um, he was a biker. He was a Harley guy in true form in all ways. He had on the leather pants and he had on the vest. He had the tats up and down his arm. He had so many holes in his head, I can't even remember. He had the crazy hair down the back and it's short and tight on the sides. And that was Harv. Harv was just such an interesting guy. And so I remember my dad sitting down and Harv was a popular barber in our area, but he was also known as the town drunk. And so I remember sitting there and experiencing this environment for the first time, and we got our haircuts, and we left, and then we came back six weeks later. And then we came back six weeks later. And then when we started walking in the door, Harv said, oh, that's the preacher. That's the preacher's kids. You better watch your language, right? And then it became, hey, hey, preacher, what's going on at the church, right? Hey, preacher. What's going on at the church this week? Hey, preacher, what are you speaking about this week? Hey, preacher, what are you reading about this week, right? And week or months after months and years, we were in this small town for about five years. And every six weeks, I remember we were at Harve's shop. And Harve and my dad became best buds. Harve was just a good guy, <laughs> You know, and, and him and my dad, for some reason, made an amazing connection. And going to Harv's was just second nature. Nobody in our church understood it or made sense of it, but we went to Harv's. And I remember when my dad stood up on a Sunday morning and resigned to the church. My dad was called to another church. And I remember thinking, who's going to cut our hair, <laughs> right? Like, Harv is our barber, right? He, he's our guy. And so we moved about um, two hours away to another church. And um, I, we moved in there, and about six weeks later, my dad said, get in the car. And I said, what? He said, get in the car. We're going to see Harv. I was like, we're going to drive two hours to get our hair cut, and then we're going to drive two hours back. He goes, yeah, we're, we're gonna go, that's who cuts our hair. It's Harv. And so we got in the car, and I remember doing this weeks after weeks and months after months. I eventually graduated from high school and going to college. My dad moved on to another church, and he's pastoring there now two and a half hours away. And I remember once every six weeks, my dad getting in the car and driving to Harv's, two and a half hours. He would sit there for an hour. He'd get in his car and drive two. It took, it was an all day thing, once every six weeks. And then one day, Harv said, what's this thing about Jesus? Jesus loves me. Right? My dad, for years and years, invested in a relationship, and he just slowly just leaked Jesus, leaked Jesus, leaked his testimony, leaked his story with this man. And it took years, and it took time, but guess what? Was it a good investment? It changed Harv's life for eternity. When my dad passed away, you know, the one person I wanted to see was Harv. You can make a difference. It's, it's not as hard as the devil wants you to what the devil wants you to think it to be. It's not that hard. It's just loving people. It's living life with people. It's sharing what Jesus is doing in your life. It's not about the one time that I said yes to Jesus. Jesus is still working on me. And there's still good news of things that Jesus is doing in my life that I should be actively sharing with my family and my friends and my neighbors. Because again, church, there are desperate people looking for hope. This is the best time ever in history to share the good news of Jesus. 
everybody's depressed because of the news and everybody thinks the world's going to hell. Whatever, this is the best time because people are looking for hope. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? The holiday season is amazing because we get around our weird family members. The people that we see maybe once a year, once, once or twice, we'll get an email or a text from them or whatever. This is a great time of the year where you can start leaking Jesus to people. Will you do it? Will you be committed to it? The, the next two Wednesdays, I really hope you take advantage of this class. We, we, we want to teach you. We want to equip you as a church to share the good news of your life. Some, some of us have never just taken the time to sit down and say, hey, what has Jesus done for me? What we're going to do in this class is we're going to slow you down, and we just want you to think through your story. And we're going to help you to articulate it to your family member and friends this holiday season. So the band's going to come up, and we're going to sing a closing song, and we have all these amazing balloons. And what these balloons symbolize for me is good news, that we have the good news of Jesus, and we need to share it with other people. The amazing thing about helium balloons is they don't go down in a day. My wife's birthday was on October 3rd, and we still have balloons floating through our house. My dream for you this holiday season is if, that, that you would come and respond this morning by saying, yes, I will share the good news of Jesus this holiday season, and I'm going to take a balloon with me. And just leave the balloon in your house. May it be this constant reminder that we have good news. May it be a conversation piece for your kids of, uh, Dad, why do we have It's a Boy balloon in our living room, right? And we can just remind them that we have been changed by Jesus, and we are to share the good news with our family and friends this holiday season. Will you stand with me? I want to pray for you, and I want you to pray for me. We have a big task, task church, but God's going to go with us, and God's going to give us courage to share the good news of Jesus this holiday season. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your servant Saul and how you radically changed his life on the Damascus Road. Many of us in this room or here today is because we've had very similar experiences where you have changed us, you have transformed us, you, we have experienced um, your forgiveness and your grace, and we are thankful for that. God, give us boldness and courage during this season that we would share the good news and the hope and the peace that we have found in Jesus. Would we share that with the people that are around us that are hurting, and that desperately need a touch from you? God, I just pray as we close that we would be obedient in whatever name, whatever face, whatever place you are calling us to, may we say yes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.